الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. This session represents the first of a series on the soul of Hajj. You've all attended lectures, classes, circles in which Hajj has been discussed. But the focus is usually on the rites and the rituals. What you should do at this point, what you shouldn't do, when you should do, etc., etc. We won't be focusing on that in our series. We will be looking at all of the elements of Hajj. So it will be as if we have gone through all of the components that make up Hajj. But our focus will be on the spiritual aspects of the Hajj. This series represents a spiritual guide to Hajj. In order to put Hajj in its proper context, we should compare it first and foremost to journeys that people take. People in this world take journeys for a variety of different reasons. Usually they're taken for pleasure. People travel to sightsee, for vacation, etc. These are journeys. People will make pilgrimage to the Taj Mahal, for example, in India, for sightseeing purposes. Or people make journeys for livelihood. We have large numbers of human beings leaving their homes and heading out for work purposes in order to obtain livelihood. We also see people making this type of journey for entertainment. We have the World Cup, the Super Bowl, the Olympics. Large numbers of people will also take an expensive journey and head out in order to attend these various events. However, Hajj is in another category altogether. And we do find it in all of the major religions. We do find this idea of journey to a location for religious reasons. Not seeking any monetary gain, not seeking any entertainment, sightseeing, but going driven by a spiritual necessity. The commandments of the religion or in accordance with the teachings of uh, some of the leading figures of the religion. So we find in the Quran Allah telling us that Hajj, this pilgrimage, is something due to Allah. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ إِسْتَطَاعِ it is a duty to Allah. So the main purpose has been defined. It is for the sake of Allah. And because it is for the sake of Allah, then only those who are able are obliged. The obligation is not for those who don't have the means. Otherwise, it would be an unfair obligation. Allah 
does not burden us with anything we cannot handle. As he said, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Now, what distinguishes the Hajj of Islam from the pilgrimage of the Buddhists or the Hindus or Christians is that the pilgrimage, the Hajj, is there in the scripture. I just mentioned, Walillahi ala nasi hajjul bayt. It is there written in the scripture. When you go into Christianity, you will not find pilgrimage specified there. People have designated places of pilgrimage, Jerusalem, because Jesus was born there. So they've made it a place of pilgrimage. People will go there for spiritual, religious reasons. But you will not find it in the Gospels or even in the false writings of Paul that pilgrimage to Jerusalem is something desirable, that there will be certain rewards for doing it with God. You will not find it. Similarly, in Buddhist uh, tradition, there are places of pilgrimage. People go to the place where Buddha was supposed to have been born or where he did something or something or something or the other or some of his followers went here, lived here, died here, something so people make it a place of pilgrimage which revives their, the spirit of their belief. But you will not find in the teachings of Buddha that he said make pilgrimage to such and such a place. It's not there. Even in Hinduism, with its festivals and these type of things, they have many of them, you will still not find it in the original scriptures. People have places designated for them by early gurus, uh, pundits, people who were uh, knowledgeable in the religion, they specified and identified rites, etc., for the people to do. So, Hajj in Islam is unique from this perspective. It is there in the scripture itself. It is defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, the general order, the general instruction. And we find within the sunnah, the clarification or explanation of Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam, we find the methodology, the details given. So, Hajj is something established in the religion from the very beginning. So we can say, yes, God has commanded it. The other religions cannot say God commanded it. People commanded it. People re re recommended it. People found reasons to do it. Because this desire to make Hajj is something which Allah has put within human beings. It is something which Allah has put within human beings. And that is why uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a designated place for pilgrimage for humankind as a whole. But if we look at the pilgrimage from the spiritual perspective that Allah has prescribed it for certain needs that human beings have. We have to say, well, what happened to the rest of humankind? The world population now is 7 billion. Out of that 7 billion, 1.5 billion know about this obligation. The remainder 
the other five and a half billion, they don't recognize this obligation. They say it's a Muslim thing. They don't know that it's really on everybody, on all of humankind. So only 1.5 billion actually know that it's an obligation. And from that 1.5 billion, only about 4 million make Hajj every year. 4 million out of 1.5 billion is what? Less than 1%. So, Allah has prescribed for us Hajj when only a fraction of the Ummah will manage to do it. Only a fraction of the Ummah will manage to do it. And it is Allah SWT who decides who will be able to and who won't. It is his qadr. He determines who has the means and who doesn't have the means. So it would seem that since Allah is the one who decides who can go and who can't go, and then he has only limited those able to go to a very small fraction. It would seem unfair. Because we know there are some huge rewards. So the rest of the Ummah has no chance for these rewards. That's how it would seem. Because they can't make Hajj. However, because of the fact that Hajj itself, its goals are the goals of Islam. There is nothing in Hajj which is above and beyond what is accessible through the other pillars of Hajj. Hajj summarizes, it gathers them all together, but it doesn't go beyond the parameters of Islam, the five pillars of Islam. So, though people may not be able to make it the same goals for which they are seeking is attainable. These other goals are all attainable through the other pillars of Islam. So nobody misses out. Hajj is like a compact opportunity, but the opportunity is there. The main goal of Hajj, what is it? The main goal is the same goal that we find defined by Allah SWT for worship, for fasting, for giving zakah. The same goal, even from the shahada itself. What is that goal? The goal is remembrance of Allah. Dhikrullah. That is the essential goal of Hajj. Allah said concerning Salah, أَقِمْ الصَّلَاةِ لِذِكْرِي Establish the prayer in order to remember me. لِذِكْرِي He also said concerning fasting, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O you who believe fasting was prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you in order that you fear Allah. That you are conscious of Allah. Fear His displeasure. Seek His pleasure. Taqwa, a consciousness of Allah. That is the goal. When we look at the Hajj itself, we find Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi saying, "Innama ju'ila tawafu bil bait, wa bil safa wal marwa, wa rami al jimar li iqamati dhikrillah." Circumambulating the house, walking between Mount Safa and Marwa, and casting pebbles at the pillar, were only made to establish the remembrance of Allah. That 
is the ultimate goal. Remembrance of Allah. So this goal of being conscious and aware of God is one, as we said, found in all of the other pillars of Islam. They are to remind us of God, of Allah. So nobody misses out. Furthermore, Prophet Muhammad wasallam had said that for one who after the morning prayer, Salatul Fajr, he or she sits in their place, continues to remember Allah until sunrise. And he or she makes two units of prayer. They get the reward of an accepted Hajj and Umrah. They get the reward of an accepted Hajj and Umrah. So what is this saying? It's saying that for those who are not able to make it to Mecca, it is still possible to attain the rewards of Hajj and Umrah right where we are at home. So nobody misses out. Now, it might seem rather simple. How could it be that for such a simple act that a person would get such a great reward? equivalent to those who are going on this huge journey, spending, etc., etc. Well, if Allah blessed you with wealth, made it possible for you to go, then that's your way of getting it. For those who don't have access to that way, then they can access it right in their locales, in the masjids. And this is why the wives of the Prophet wasallam, they used to go to the masjid for Salatul Fajr. This was when they were known to go out and pray. The women of Medina used to go out and pray in the masjid for Salatul Fajr and Salatul Isha. But especially Salatul Fajr. Today, women don't go to the masjids, except in Ramadan. Or, of course, in some countries, they're not allowed in the masjids. So we have other issues too. Muslims have become so ignorant as to actually prevent women from going into the mosques. But for those who are in places where it is possible, we don't find them going. I know in different places where uh, my wives have tried to go into masjids, you know, we have to get special permission from the imam. Can you open up the door? Or the muadzin, can you open up the door so my wife can pray fajr? <laughs> See, your wife wants to pray fajr? Why? <laughs> Why? Because it's sunnah. <laughs> it's sunnah. So, this is the state of the ummah. We have strayed away from this sunnah and therein lies a great reward some scholars say well actually she can do it at home she can stay in her home and since the term masjid means the place of prayer if she has a designated place in her home that she prays and she stays in that place afterwards then she gets the reward. But were that the case, then the wives of the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't have bothered to go for Fajr. Their example, and the women of Medina, their example shows us that what was intended was the masjid, not the place in your home that you have designated for prayer, though you might call it my masjid my place of prostration. Technically, what was understood by the Prophet ﷺ when he said, whoever prays 
Salat al-Fajr in Jama'ah. This is Jama'ah in the Masjid. And stays on remembering Allah until sunrise and prays two units of prayer. Ishraq earns the reward of an accepted Hajj and Umrah. And Hajj, as we said, summarizes all of the other aspects of worship. It combines the three basic elements of the pillars of Islam, our major acts of worship are either verbal or intellectual, that is, the declaration of faith. We should have understood it and we express it. It's not a physical act but a verbal expression. Then we have physical acts like the five times daily prayer and we have the fasting in Ramadan. Those are physically focused. And then we have monetary acts of worship. Zakah and Sadaqah. Zakah is obligatory. Sadaqah is recommended voluntary charity. Now, when we look at Hajj, the intellectual and verbal aspect of worship is found where? In the Talbiyah. That's what we're doing. We're expressing our intent. We're renewing our Shahada. We'll look at that in more details, but there it is. To become a Muslim, to enter into Islam, you only have to declare it one time. Of course, we do say it every day in our prayers, in tashahud. We do repeat our declaration of faith. But in Hajj, we repeat that declaration of faith from the time that we reach the Miqat, we enter into the state of Ihram, we repeat it and we repeat it continually till we see the Kaaba. Or if we're going on to Hajj, we keep on doing it until we stone the Jamrah on the last, on the tenth. So this far exceeds the normal verbal and intellectual expression of worship through the Shahada. In terms of the physical aspects, our praying and our fasting at home, of course, in Hajj, there is prayer. Fasting if you're not able to make the sacrifice. But from a physical perspective, tawaf around the Kaaba, sa'i between Safa and Marwa, just the distance between Safa and Marwa is 3.5 kilometers. And we have to do that more than once. How much it is for tawaf will vary between whether you are close to the Kaaba or you're making tawaf on the roof. It's a huge difference. But it is a serious amount of physical effort. So the physical element of worship is there in the Hajj. In fact, Prophet ﷺ had called tawaf salah. But you don't have rukur and sujood in it. Walking salah. It's there. On top of the other forms of prayer that we will do throughout the Hajj. And of course, the monetary aspect is obviously there. The cost to go and make Hajj today is quite a sum. Only a small number could afford it. In the past, it was much cheaper, but the journey was more arduous, took much longer, less people were able to go because of other factors. 
Today you can fly in and fly out, but the cost is huge. In the past you could set out on your donkey or your horse, your camel, take a boat and walk. People when they went for Hajj, it was like a one-way trip. People gave goodbyes to their family, they wrote their wills and everything. You know, It was one way for many. So though the costs varied, it was not as expensive then, but then you still had to, to be able to outfit yourself to go and make the Hajj. It wasn't easy. Of course, there were some people who felt that begging was okay, so they begged their way through Hajj. This is really not acceptable. It's not proper. Begging is haram in Islam. Even if you say, yeah, yeah, but it's Hajj. I want to make Hajj. But you don't beg your way through Hajj, no. If you don't have the finances to get to Hajj, then you wait until Allah gives you the finances. So, Hajj has combined all of the various elements of worship in Islam and multiplied each and every one of them. This, the reward for Salah in Mecca, of course, is worth 100,000 prayers elsewhere. But there are two other greater rewards. The first of which, Prophet Muhammad had said, the person who makes pilgrimage to Allah's house without committing any acts of indecency or disobedience to Allah will return home as pure from sins as he was on the day his mother bore him. He will return, she will return from Hajj, pure from sins as the day they were born. This is a great reward which people focus on. And Amr ibn al-As, he narrated that when I entered Islam, or when Islam entered my heart, I went to the Messenger of Allah and I said, give me your hand so that I may pledge allegiance to you. The Prophet ﷺ spread out his hand, put his hand forward, and I withdrew mine. When the Prophet ﷺ reached out, to take his hand, he pulled his hand back. And he said, uh, or the Prophet ﷺ asked him, What's wrong, O Amr? He said, I want to make a condition before making the pledge. He said, I want to make a condition. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, What is it? He replied, That Allah will forgive me. Then the Messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Did you know that Islam wipes out what came before it? When a person enters Islam, all previous sins are wiped out. So they're starting like the day their mother bore them. And Hijra wipes out what came before it. When a Muslim makes Hijra, Obviously, hijra for the sake of Allah, not hijra for the dunya, right? To get national, Canadian nationality, American nationality, or British nationality. We're not talking about that hijra. It's not wiping out any sins. Maybe it's going to attract many sins. <laughs> the person who makes hijra, where they leave a place where they are unable to practice Islam. Their Islam is challenged. They leave that place and they go elsewhere where they can more effectively practice Islam. In other words, they've given up their homeland or their place of residence and gone elsewhere purely in order to practice Islam better. That is hijra. The hijra that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about. When a person does that, he or she wipes out the sins which came before. 
Because that hijra is not easy. It requires a strong faith commitment. People more easily will make hijra for the dunya to get that Canadian passport. Much more easily. But you tell somebody make that hijra to be able to practice Islam better, they'll find a million and one excuses why not to. They're comfortable where they are. It involves too much effort, sacrifice, etc. And that's why one who makes that real hijra has his or her sins wiped out. And he went on to say, and hajj wipes out what came before it. And hajj wipes out what came before it. But that opportunity to gain that great reward of purification from sin, so we start on a clean slate, like a child coming into this world, free from sin. It is there for those who make the hajj. It's there for those who accept Islam. And it's there for those who make hijra. So it is accessible. Allah is most merciful. He didn't limit it only to those people who could make hajj. Because as we said, the vast majority of Muslims will not be able to make hajj. And the second major benefit is that which Prophet Muhammad identified when he said, the reward for a hajj accepted into Allah's grace, hajj mabrur, is nothing less than paradise. The reward for a hajj accepted into Allah's grace is nothing less than paradise. The ultimate goal of the believer. And the attainment of paradise, of course, is something which each and every Muslim has accessible. Because Prophet Muhammad had said, Kullu ummati yadkhulun al jannah. All of my nation, all of my ummah will enter paradise. Illa man aba. Except for the one who refuses. And when he was asked, who would refuse, O Messenger of Allah? He said, Man ata'ani dakhal al jannah. Whoever obeys me will enter paradise. Wa man asani faqad aba. And whoever disobeys me has refused. So, it is accessible for, to each and every one of us to attain Jannah by obeying Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this reward is attainable by each and every Muslim. So though Hajj has this as its ultimate reward, it is not beyond the scope of every Muslim. And that's why we know, as Allah said, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Your Lord will not be unfair to anyone. Allah is most kind and most just. However, the attainment of these rewards, whether we are here at home getting it through Salatul Ishraq, making hijra, etc. Or we're there on the hajj, it will not be easy. We can imagine, you know, Jannah, paradise, is not cheap. There is a price. And that price is a lot. It's expensive. It's not cheap. The Christians, back in the Middle Ages, they made it very cheap. 
They had what were known as papal indulgences, where the Pope used to print out a certificate, it was done by hand, which said, the bearer of this certificate has a place in paradise. And he would put his name and seal, wax. And then if you paid a certain amount of money, your name was put. The bearer of this the certificate, John Wellesley, has his place in paradise. He paid the money. Cheap. I mean, relatively expensive in those days, but cheap. If you can just buy it, buy your way into paradise. Of course, that was a delusion. It was no way to paradise. And Islam has no such thing. Anybody promising such promises like that, you best run in the opposite direction. Instead, Hajj is a trial. It will test each and every one of us who goes to make Hajj to our limits. Because the Prophet ﷺ had said, whoever makes pilgrimage to the house without committing acts of indecency or disobedience means that Hajj has to be pure. Disobedience, cursing, shouting, expressions of anger, For most people, be, being patient through the Hajj is a major trial. But what happens is that Allah throws the people together. Four million people in one place. And you can imagine, people are squashed together. People will step on your toes. They will elbow you, bang you with their belongings, you're going to get hurt. You'll come back bruised. And you have to hold yourself back. Even though the person seemed to be careless. In fact, some of them seem to do it purposely. They get pleasure out of stepping on your toe. That's not what comes to your head. But you have to put it aside. Give them the benefit of the doubt. It's accidental. And I'm here being tested. How will I respond? So we are made to suffer. Even the five-star Haji, he still has points at which he must suffer. He can't get away from it. And the Hajj for, for functions like the furnace. When you have iron ore or silver ore, you want to extract the silver. You put it in the furnace. The heat causes the ore, the pure ore, to melt and it is extracted. So the Hajj functions something like that. Purifying the believer. Because Prophet Muhammad had said that whatever pain that the believer suffers purifies that in the believer, if they're patient, from sin. Pain, even if it is only a thorn. A thorn from a tree, a rose bush, something pricks the foot. Small, there's pain. But if we are patient with it, it removes sin. Euthanasia used by 
some parts of the West and becoming more and more popular. Taking a person's life or them taking their own lives to avoid pain. They say, well, my life, I have this illness or whatever. I'm suffering. Life is not happy anymore. There's no pleasure in life anymore. So what's the point of living? Let me die. Arrange for somebody, Dr. Death, to facilitate my suicide. It's a whole different philosophy. A whole different philosophy. And I know personally that when I came into Islam in Canada and I went down to Jamaica to see if there was any Islam already there. Whether I was the first Jamaican in the world to have become a Muslim. Because I never heard of Islam. I didn't know of any Jamaican Muslims. So I went down to Jamaica. I went, visited my family there, and I asked them, did they know, were there any mosques here in Jamaica? My cousins told me, yes, yes, there's one, right, in downtown Kingston. I said, yeah, yes, yes, it's right. So, take me to it, let me go see it. So they took me down and came to this building with a big dome over it. I read, Baha'i Temple. Oh, no, it's not a mosque. The Baha'is are not Muslims. Originally, they came from Muslims in Iran, the Baha'is, but they're not a Muslim, part of the Muslim uh, body. Ummah. So, I hunted around, no mosque in Kingston. Eventually, asking around, asking around, till I found, yes, in Spanish town, the other end of the island, there was a mosque. So, I went to the mosque in Spanish town. And I met the brother who built it. Small mosque. Built it on a portion of his land. And a few people had accepted Islam. He was originally from India. His great grandparents had come there from India. And he had built this mosque and a few of the Jamaicans accepted Islam there. But he was suffering from terminal cancer. So he couldn't even make it into the master to pray anymore. He prayed at home. And he would uh, he, he would um, scream. Sometimes the pain would reach such levels that it would cause him to scream. But he was, al he was always, you know, you could hear the pain that he was suffering from. And I wondered myself, you know, at the time, wow, this man, he built the mosque. And he's suffering. You know, it's, it seems like such a sad result. He's done this good deed and here was this pain and suffering that he was having. You know, it's that same question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Hmm? This was in my head. But of course, I'm a Muslim now. I accepted Islam. I mean, though I didn't have the answer for it, I left Jamaica, went back to Canada, but it remained as something in my head. And it wasn't until when I studied in Islam this same hadith about the thorn that it purifies, it takes away sin. Sins fall from the person who is suffering if he or she is patient with it. I realized then that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was purifying this man before he would leave this world. That cancer eating away at him, causing him this great pain, but he remained steadfast on his faith, praying till his last breath. This was purification for him. It was a good thing. From the non-Muslim Western perspective, it's a bad thing. A bad thing happening to a good person. But in fact, it was a good thing. And that's why for us, we don't uh, consider 
suicide, euthanasia, any of these kind of acts is valid because it takes away the opportunity for the individual to purify himself or herself from sin through patiently bear, bearing pain and suffering. <clears throat> and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said as a general statement with regards to people the believer who mixes with people and bears their harm is better than the believer who doesn't mix with people and doesn't bear their harm. It is a higher state. To run away from people and live in a monastery off by yourself worshiping God. In other religions that becomes an ideal. The monk. He's the ideal in the monastery. That's the ideal. He's given up this worldly life. But from the Islamic perspective, no. That is the lower state. That is the weaker individual who runs away from the challenge. The one who is in the higher state is the one who mixes with the people and bears their harm. That makes him or her a greater believer. So for that spiritual transformation to take place. Where a person goes from being a sinner to one purified from sin. Which happens when the Hajj is accepted. We can understand from that that it's not going to be easy. It is about God consciousness. It's about remembrance of Allah. At all times. Throughout the Hajj. We have to be vigilantly conscious of God. When we drop our guard and we forget shaitan will be there in a minute shaitan will be there in a minute because yes there are people there making hajj for all kinds of reasons except for the correct reason you have people making hajj for all kinds of reasons financial reasons it's just a business. You have people who come from some parts of the Muslim world who hire in their countries, they will hire cripples, get a visa for them, take them to Hajj and let them beg. And they collect the money. They pay the family to bring the cripple, disabled person, as a means of raising money. Some people in Egypt, you have people there who are specialists in disabling you. You want to go make Hajj begging? Well, he'll create some kind of distortion in one of your limbs so you can go there, make yourself some money. So you have people coming for all kinds of intentions. You had people there who, whilst people were making toe off, they were in the crowd with razors cutting people's money belts, taking their money. What kind of hajj? What are they doing there? Criminals coming for hajj. So you have everything coming there. And you will run into them. So know that achieving that goal is not going to be easy. At the same time, it is important for us to know that the various obstacles which people have put in front of us for making Hajj, many of us, which are false, we should be aware of them and remove them. One of the common obstacles to Hajj is the argument 
that Hajj is supposed to be for all people. Hajj should be done by old people. Since the Hajj wipes away sin, for a young person, he's only in his 20s, whatever he wants to make Hajj, the old people will tell him, no, don't go make Hajj now. You're still young. Still a lot of sins that you're going to commit. So better you make the Hajj when you are old like us. When you're so old, you've run out of steam, you can't do any more sins. Now is the time to go make Hajj. And that's why you find so many people die on Hajj. Yeah, some of it was problems in bottlenecks, people trampling each other. Some of that happened. Some of that will happen in the Hajj. But a good portion of those who die are simply dying because they left Hajj to the last point in their lives. So they're getting off the plane, they trip on the stairs, boom, they're dead. Getting on the bus, they slip on the bus, rolls over them, dead. People dying left and right in their Hajj. And people say, MashaAllah, he died on Hajj. But what happened? You know, this person was actually an evil individual who continued to do sins all the way up until the last moment. Then he goes to make Hajj. Is that Hajj going to purify him? The fact that he died falling off the stairs of the plane in Jeddah or under a bus in Mecca or Mina, is that going to purify him? Yes, Prophet ﷺ did say, for a man making pilgrimage, whose animal he was riding, reared up, he fell down and the animal trampled him, that he would be in paradise. And his death there purified him. But is he the same as the others who were delaying Hajj, specifically to be able to commit more sins? No. If that intention is not sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Hajj will not do anything. It will only be pain and suffering. The other unacceptable <coughs> argument found in some parts of the Muslim world, especially the parts in Southeast Asia, and these people from Southeast Asia don't think that I'm picking on you all the time, but you seem to have a lot of these things. The other element is the belief that if you have daughters, who are unmarried, you are excused from Hajj until you get them married. They are priority. Why? Because the giving of the mahar in these lands has been reversed. Normally, the man gives mahar to the woman to indicate his preparedness to look after her. But Hindu tradition has it that the woman gives mahar to the man, the family of the woman. She gives mahar. They don't call it mahar. Maybe they call it something else. Gifts. A name. But in the end, it's mahar. Gives a mahar to the man. So they have to give him all kinds of things in order to get him to marry their daughter. <clears throat> Daughters are a liability. That's why they abort so many of them. at the time of birth, before birth, that the demographics of India has changed. There are more men in India than women. This is unusual. Nowhere else in the world except for China do you find this. And in China it's the same thing. In China, you're only allowed to have one child according to law. So if you have the choice only of having one child, then what do you want? A boy. If you have a girl, somebody marries her and takes her. All the money you spend to raise her up, gone. If you have a boy, he's still connected to the family. 
he's a support, whatever, he's part of the family business, whatever, he's a benefit. The girl is a liability. So, they aborted and they continue to abort huge numbers of female fetuses in China and India. Till the demographics changed. Unnatural. So, the idea among the Hindus, since girls are a liability, Muslims have adopted or have kept these practices. They came into Islam, but they kept this practice with them of giving dowry to the men. So if a man has daughters, and I remember one of my friends when I was in Riyadh, he was like in his early 30s. His head was completely gray. I said, what happened to you, man? It's only 31, 32. He said, brother, my father died and I have five sisters. He couldn't even get married. He was just working to get his sisters married. You know, it was like tragedy. You know, this huge burden on his head. I said, well, you know, Islam said, I said, he said, I know. <laughs> I agree with you. I heard your talk about Mahar and I agree 100%. Alhamdulillah. Sunnah is the other way. But nobody's going to marry my sisters unless I pay them. That's reality. So, in order to meet this reality, then this idea spread. If you have daughters, you're excused from Hajj until you get them married. This is a lie. It's falsehood. What is obligatory is that once you have the financial means to make Hajj, then it is obligatory for you to do so. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already set the principles of family and how family is created and the mahar is not to be given that way. Once you change, you reverse the system which Allah has ordained, then you create this situation which now causes people not to make hajj. We also have another aspect of hajj which uh, we could say denies those who make the hajj the benefit. Where people are making hajj for the prestige of making hajj. So they can be known as hajji or hajja. They take a title. There are special caps in some countries where only people who make hajj are allowed to wear these caps. Other countries, women only wear hijab after they make hajj. And for some people, hajj becomes a sightseeing tour. We have express hajj where they fly you in to catch Arafah, because Hajj is Arafah. So you can cut your Hajj down to a minimum of like three days Hajj, in and out. Of course, you still can't escape the Tawaf, the, the stoning. These are clusters in the Hajj which are intense, but when you go to Hajj seeking other goals other than the Hajj, then of course it will not do anything. It will be a feather in your cap, a stripe on your shoulder, whatever. You know, you can say, yeah, I made five Hajjs. Somebody else says, no, I made ten, mashallah. But that's not what Hajj is really about. Hajj is about remembering 